Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, today's um, uh, CRS uh, seminar. Uh, I'm Sean Rehag. I'm the director of the Center for Refugee Studies and a faculty member at uh, Osgoode Hall uh, Law School. I'm delighted to welcome you all here uh, today to hear uh, from uh, John Carla, uh, who is a, a postdoctoral uh, fellow uh, at the uh, Canada uh, Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at uh, Ryerson uh, University. Uh, many uh, folks connected to CRS are, are very familiar uh, with uh, John. Uh, he completed his doctorate uh, here at uh, York University in, uh, in political science. And uh, while he did that, he was uh, affiliated with the uh, Center for uh, refugee uh, studies. Uh, he uh, assisted us, for example, with our Syria uh, response and uh, a refugee uh, initiative, uh, for which uh, we continue to be uh, very uh, grateful. Um, today, uh, John is going to be uh, speaking uh, to us uh, about uh, partisan neoconservatism and uh, refugees uh, in uh, Canada. Uh, the plan is that he's going to uh, show us a uh, presentation um, and then uh, that will be followed by a, a Q&A uh, session that uh, I will uh, moderate. So, uh, John, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. Um, I'm really grateful to be here today. Uh, the center has been, was a wonderful home during my grad studies. And uh, as you mentioned, the Syria Response and Refugee Initiative was a really nice opportunity to work kind of in the opposite direction of most of the trends I will discuss today. Um, the, so the talk today uh, is going to uh, build on a few things that I've been working on. Um, so I'm looking at the trajectory of the Conservative Party of Canada primarily with respect to its approach to uh, refugees, but this is um, growing out of its trajectory from its origins in the Reform Party. And part of a larger approach I'm trying to look at uh, with respect to immigration and multiculturalism in Canada, kind of looking at both projects from above and projects from below. And so the, the project of the Conservative Party I'm framing as kind of a neoconservative multiculturalism from above, um, which you can contrast it with perhaps a neoliberal version under the liberals, um, but that's a kind of a different question and different uh, presentation. But the conservatives in this project, um, I'm arguing have really formed kind of a pragmatic, but a very disciplinary and in many ways um, neoconservative political project. And this really plays out when it comes to citizenship, immigration and multiculturalism policies and discourses. And that the political project has um, substantive negative effects on many members of our society. Uh, and today I'll be talking about that, particularly with, res with respect to refugees. And part of that is creating a project somewhat of insiders and outsiders within a neoconservative political coalition. And this has been a, a pretty creative and malleable project that they've really fought on the terrain, both of civil society, um, but also with in parliament. And it's got a mix of discursive, but also substantive po policy realities. And so this really just built out of my, is out of my dissertation and a couple of pieces I published, one with the Journal of Canadian Studies and another with, um, with Ryerson's uh, CERC program. So what I'm not going to do today because it would take too much time is a thorough review, of course, of all of the policies towards refugees that the Conservatives engaged in. And I'm not going to be really asserting that there is a, an unproblematic approach now that we've returned to liberal government. So um, I, I just want to note, you know, these are kind of projects and approaches that we face within settler colonialism um, and exclusion towards refugees in many ways, but not alternatives to a broader, more inclusive vision. Um, 
Well, one of the key theoretical um, inspirations for my approach to this work is some of Stuart Hall's work on authoritarian populism that he really emerged in the, in the British context. Um, but he employs Gramsci, and I think a really key point that he makes is that uh, a neoconservative political project has to take place within the content or within the common sense understandings and social relations of a given society. And that this is done not by just imposing an ideology from scratch on a society, but all, a lot of creative ideological and political work is involved in such a process. And I like this quote from Hall because he argues for the need of kind of creating a new and even an exclusionary common sense means a, a lot of ideological struggle and, and work and kind of a calling of older traditions mixed with newer approaches. And hopefully as I, my remarks, this, the importance of this will become uh, clearer. In terms of grasping contemporary neoconservatism at the federal level of politics in Canada, um, when I talk about multiculturalism, for example, uh, I mean this as a kind of contested common sense and ideological terrain. And I think the treatment of refugees in Canada is part of this. Um, Canada has common sense notions about our inclusivity and our multiculturalism and our kind of our self image as generous to refugees is actually a part of that. And the conservatives have to operate within that common sense. Now, my approach to this um, in my dissertation and also my writings uh, was to read and offer some maybe reinterpretation of the writings of conservative thinkers, especially Tom Flanagan, an influential actor within the reform and conservative parties, and then looking at the discourses and of course, substantive policy analysis um, with respect to the conservative government and party. So I wanted to start this a little bit more tracing a bit more of the history and the evolution of the discourses of the Conservative Party, uh, particularly with respect to immigration and refugees. So what I would say is that the Conservative Party still even today is, in, is really an outgrowth of the Reform Party, um, but is ha it had to deal with the limits of its, of its prior approach. And so the Reform Party arose actually in many ways in the 1980s and early 90s as a rejection of this more centrist common sense around questions of immigration, multiculturalism, even our approach to refugees. And it was in some ways a rejection of a kind of centrist multiculturalism under the liberals and the progressive conservatives. And this is of interest because a lot of the key actors in the Conservative Party arose through the Reform Party, such as Stephen Harper and Jason Kenney, who we're all familiar with from their time in office. Um, but when you look at the conservative writings, it's quite interesting. Um, Tom Flanagan talks about the conservative political approach. And when he refers to the Reform Party, he kind of argued that this was an invasion from the right of Canada's political system. Um, but his metaphors will change, as we'll see as, as we go. And so the Reform Party had some kind, some problematic rhetoric around immigration, um, also around refugees, but I focused on the immigration rhetoric just to note that they seem to have this alarm over the, the demographic shifts that were taking place in Canada. So asserting that you know immigration policy was contributing to these troubling changes purportedly to the ethnic makeup of Canada. And also that um, immigration policy needed to be more sensitive to kind of populist concerns. And so what I would argue though is including its approach to refugees, the conservatives actually went through some phases that are very important for us to understand when we consider their approach to refugees. So as I mentioned, they had this kind of invasion from the margin approach from the right of Canadian politics. 
But then over the course of the 1990s and early 2000s, they really cleaned up their discourse to remove some of the most offensive elements of it. And I argue um, using in part um, writings by Flanagan in 2011, when he was talking about the conservative approach to attain a majority government, his metaphors actually changed to that of achieving what he called a minimum winning coalition which was just enough voters to, to achieve a majority government, but not so many voters that they really would have to water down their principles, for example. And I argue that this is actually a disciplinary and in many ways exclusionary minimum winning coalition that they tried to achieve, um, but they had to adjust their discourses with respect to refugees to a different, significant degree um, as part of that project. And I, another point, I'm not going to leave these slides up here, but there's also a civilizational bent to conservative discourses in the early 90s that Canada had kind of moved away from its core culture as part of kind of the Anglosphere of nations. Um, but the conservatives were trying to shift Canadian common sense to a neoconservative understanding. And this included even joining things like the war on terror and that Canada's approach also in its discourses, you would see this especially in discourse, in, in the citizenship policies are that Canada needed kind of a um, approach against things like barbaric cultural practices, that we are kind of a tolerant Western society. So this plays out in our discourses internally towards refugees and civil society, but also our place in global geopolitics, which will, I hopefully will help make some sense as we, as we move forward. So as we kind of continue this neoconservative journey with respect to immigration and refugees, um, with the with the transition in the late reform party, but especially moving from the Canadian Alliance to the Conservative Party of Canada, we start to see clearer dual discourses of what we could call xenophilia and, xenoph and xenophobia. So a mix of inclusive, but on the other hand, disciplinary exclusionary discourses. And I think this makes sense if we think about um, the political invitations that the Conservative Party starts to make. And so you see, um, as we move from the reform to the Canadian Alliance incarnation of the party, so just a footnote for anyone who's, who's newer to the, the Canadian context, um, Canada had the rise of the Reform Party to the 1980s. They renamed themselves uh, the Canadian Alliance, and then they subsequently merged with or took over our Federal Conservative Party. But with each of these incarnations, there were shifts in their discourses. But if you look on the discourses on the left, which are under the Canadian Alliance, you see this discourse of we will welcome new Canadians, but we will keep the criminals out. And Canadians are a nation of immigrants, we're very generous people, but then they have this dual discourse of that we are angry by policies that let illegal migrants and queue jumpers into the country. So you see this dual inclusionary and exclusionary discourse. And the exclusionary side, even for a short period, was more silenced under the Conservative Party, as you see in its 20, 2004 platform and its discourse about how immigration has enriched Canada. But these dual discourses also play out in the refugee field. Um, so just to maybe summarize the journey the Conservatives took um, in their incarnations, the Reform Party project, um, because of these Canadian common sense ideas of generosity, really reached their limits. There was a ceiling on what you could achieve within Canada with kind of overtly exclusionary discourses. So we, we see this, uh, these overt problematic discourses under the Reform Party. Then we see a shift where there's a maintain of a theme of alarm or control of the border and the immigration system um, with 
And we see a concern around cultural concerns or clash of civilizations discourses as well by the early 2000s. But then we see under the Conservative Party, the invitation to good immigrants to be appealed to, but quote unquote, bad immigrants and refugees who could be targeted and excluded. But we'll see over time, this actually is malleable as well. So just in terms of the pragmatic driver of these shifts, um, I borrow, I use this slide that's actually from a conservative PowerPoint presentation, but it's, this is from 2011, but I think it captures a lot of the realities of the, the pragmatic nature of this project and that the conservatives, when it comes to immigrants uh, and racialized and ethnicized voters are noting, there are lots more of them, there will be more soon, and they're living where we need to live. And so this kind of helps us understand the rationale be, behind needing this more inclusive uh, discourse, even with the inclusions that are implied. And Harper struck a balance of this himself as he ran to be leader of the Alliance Party, um, noting that he's pro-immigration in principle, but he feels that our refugee determination system um, was a problematic backdoor into our immigration system that needed to be tightened. Now, so I've tried to, um, in some of my writing, kind of summarize what are the, became the core essence of the Conservative Party and it's these dual discourses and approaches. And what I kind of have come up with in terms of summarizing their authoritarian populist approach is, is kind of a summary of these dual discourses and practices, um, maybe signaled a bit here in the two images of Jason Kenney. One, a, a happy, smiling Jason Kenney of outreach efforts, but on the other hand, an angry Jason Kenney of authoritarian populist exclusion. So those trends really I mentioned is this more pragmatic uh, form of outreach and in a nationalist uh, common sense that with nods to diversity, um, the authoritarian populist approach to policy, which I'll, I'll move to this clash of civilizations discourses, which we will see um, and the key trend for us today is an authoritarian populist demonization of refugees and other vulnerable migrants, but particularly refugee claimants. Um, and another trend that we won't talk about today, though, is the changes to our immigration model with a, a tremendous rise in precarity, especially with migrant workers. But as I would mentioned, part of this is the ideological struggle of, of what I'm calling neoconservative multiculturalism. And so the xenophilic outreach side where we welcome immigrants, um, but also a hollowing out of Canadian multiculturalism, if you look at the substance of their approach, which I can't summarize today. Um, but part of this is is their kind of appropriation of a former progressive conservative legacy uh, while rejecting um, the more centrist aspects of that. But I think it is important in their formation of a common sense around Canadian multiculturalism that it does designate outsiders to this um, kind of coalition they're trying to build, particularly asylum seekers and refugee claimants. And so part of this, I think a good example is the, the conservatives approach to um, refugee health care as kind of a sign that this was no longer the kind of progressive conservatism we had seen in Canada's past. Uh, so part of their refugee reforms were to cut uh, health care benefits for refugees from certain countries. But at the same time as they have this project of exclusion, they would also reach back to more inclusionary aspects of the progressive conservative past. And this was kind of noted in this multiculturalism award that they had created to recognize a progressive conservative senator who had used multiculturalism discourses in the 1960s. Um, so I'll continue. So I mentioned one of the key trends here is this authoritarian populist demonization of refugees and other vulnerable migrants. 
I think this flyer that the Conservatives had distributed uh, while in office actually captures a lot of these realities uh, or discourses, I should say. So this notion that Canada's immigration system is the world's most fair and generous, but we will not tolerate bogus asylum claimants and foreign criminals and abusing of Canadian generosity. So this, this dual discourse is at play. And part of this now as we turn to policy um, is that the Conservatives really um, launched an assault uh, when it comes to refugee claimants in Canada. And part of this uh, was kind of breaking for a while Canada's refugee determination system uh, before they, to, in order to justify some of their subsequent reforms. And so I have a quote here, I thought from Audrey Macklin that it, summarized the situation well that the, the government kind of took a system and they broke it. And then by the, in 2009, Jason Kenney is asserting in speeches that the system is broken. And you can see over time that we see a tremendous um, increase in the backlog in the, at the Immigration and Refugee Board. And this is the body that adjudicates um, asylum claims in and so you, we have these discourses from Kenny about fraudulent asylum seekers um, being juxtaposed with the millions of refugees who are stuck overseas, for example, in refugee camps. And this juxtaposition of um, Canada being taken advantage of by refugee claimants um, while their sympathy expressed to the uh, millions of people in camps around the world, for example. And I argue this is part of the Conservatives' approach to refugees, where they weaponize really this discourse and, and self-belief of Canadian generosity. But it's worth noting, and I, these statistics are borrowed from Shauna Labman's uh, recent book, but there were little to no increases in government assisted refugees or to privately sponsored refugees during the Conservatives time in office. So while this is a discursive point that they make, um, while they're attacking in many ways refugee claimants, they're not matching this discourse of the millions displaced around the world with a proactive approach to refugee settle, uh, resettlement. And as we in see in Canada, some of the shifts taking place under the Conservatives then are kind of a shift in an increase in economic class migration, a drop in the family class. The Conservatives actually made uh, humanitarian classes of, of immigration more difficult to reach, in part by making it that you couldn't uh, file a humanitarian and compassionate grounds application at the same time as a refugee claim. And some of their exclusionary trends or policies towards refugees uh, did contribute to declines in the number of refugees granted permanent residence or the number of asylum claims. Although certainly some of those trends are related to the earlier Canada-US safe third country agreement under the Liberals, um, but some of their visa policies and other measures uh, certainly contributed to these declines. And I'm not going to go through all the shifts in policy. Um, just to note, though, that the Conservatives really did make shifts within the state that were very harsh towards refugees, such as you know, increasing the resources towards departmental staff, um, contesting refugee claimants in their hearings, for example. They implemented Bill C-31, which created different classes of, of refugee claims. Um, so there was a number of measures that they did that attacked the security of refugees, including even after they became permanent residents through cessation, um, through cessation and other measures to, um, to decrease the level of security that refugees have in Canada. And this was, of course, enacted in, in Bill C-31 especially. 
So alongside this inclusion or this exclusion though, that was quite rampant, there were attempts to kind of clean up their, their discourse or at least improve their image. So simultaneously, while the conservatives were implementing or trying to get Bill C-31 passed, they would also implement some smaller measures. And what's, what's of concern here is not measures that would actually otherwise be very welcome. For example, uh, the fact that the conservatives would implement a pathway uh, for some LGBTQ plus asylum seekers to come to Canada is actually um, in an advance in response to civil society demands. Um, but it's the manner in, in which it was done in some respects. So the slides here that you have images of, the pictures, are that at the time the Conservatives were implementing Bill C-31, um, which many members of the LGBTQ plus community were noting would harm um, gay refugee asylum seekers, such as cutting the time to prepare a claim, for example, or the designated countries of origin list. Um, the Conservatives actually sent out an email uh, to emails that they had kind of called through emails expressing concern about, the, about their approach to immigrant and refugee policy to a touted a rather small, although important initiative that many in the, that community had said were really forms of pink washing of their refugee policy. And the other problem that they found in this message from Kenny was that it highlighted only the problem of the treatment of um, LGBTQ plus people in Iran and ignoring the situation in other countries, for example. But this program, which by 2019 had resettled approximately 80 people, um, was used in some ways to kind of cleanse the conservatives' approach to refugees, but also engage in somewhat of this kind of clash of civilizations discourse between a civilized Canada, for example, and the Iranian regime. Um, so this had been really noted by um, people who Kenny had sent this letter to, and some of them even published an open letter in response to this. So these are some of the kind of ideological um, approaches to, to kind of clean up their, their reputation. And another way you see this playing out politically is very different treatment of refugee claimants when they're in vulnerable situations versus the form of political outreach you would see from the conservatives uh, when they're trying to achieve um, greater support within a community, for example. So when the MV Sun, Sea and Ocean Lady uh, boats, for example, arrived to Canada uh, from Sri Lanka, uh, the Conservative government launched many punitive measures. Uh, they detained and harshly interrogated uh, these refugee claimants. They employed discourses of terrorism. Uh, they opposed their claims at refugee hearings and a variety of measures um, that, the, that have been well chronicled. But then later seeking support um, in 2013, the Conservatives uh, would boycott the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Summit, for example, that was held in Sri Lanka um, as part of, in part, um, to appeal to voters from different communities. So there's a very different substantive treatment of people who um, many might share similar backgrounds when they're in the situation of being a refugee claimant to Canada, uh, versus when they're a Canadian citizen and one might potentially uh, win their vote. Now, by the time we reach the 2015 federal election, there's quite a bit of fatigue with the conservative approach. Um, around that time, there were controversies, for example, around uh, their discourses of barbaric cultural practices. Um, as well in the news was their slow response to Syrian refugees especially with uh, the photos of Alan Kurdi that had emerged um, from a Turkish beach, for example. 
Uh, there were the discourses of citizenship stripping and the niqab ban essentially in citizenship ceremonies and a discourse in the political debates uh, where Stephen Harper invoked the sensibilities of old stock Canadians, for example, in, in justifying cuts to refugee health care. Um, so these punitive measures did catch up with the Conservatives, and we did see a switch to a Liberal government. And some have attributed this change in government um, in part to movements from below or a form of social movement electoralism in a piece by Kellogg um, that's quite interesting. Now, as we move to the end of the Conservatives' time in office, uh, I wanted to mention, to touch on uh, the Conservatives' actions since then, but also point out um, point towards longer term struggles in civil society over common sense ideas about Canada, which particularly um, they do impact refugees, of course. So in the global context, of course, since 2015, we see the rise in right wing populism and racism globally and anti immigrant sentiments and discourses. And we see, of course, factors from the United States. Uh, we see uh, asylum seekers coming to Canada from there, in part as a response to measures under the Trump administration. Um, but I will note that we have our own long-term domestic struggles in this realm as well as I move through this. Now, just in terms of you know, who the Conservative Party of Canada is allied with internationally, it's part of the Global Democratic Union or Alliance of Conservative Parties globally. And we do have some problematic partners in this. I mean, of course, we have the US Republican Party. Uh, we also have um, the Hungarian current government under Viktor Orban. And just that within that family, uh, there was some controversy, for example, when Stephen Harper uh, congratulated him on his re-election to um, power in Hungary after implementing many, of course, anti-immigrant measures. So there's a kind of a global context of the political right um, in terms of partisan politics. Um, but the conservative response to these rising sentiments were oft has often in the last few years been to amplify rather than to temper these uh, kind of farther right discourses. And we saw this play out with respect to the Global Compact for Refugees, for example. There was a, a swirling discourse around this about the globalist UN that was going to kind of take over our sovereignty. And so the Conservatives in their fundraising and public discourse has really played into this. And you see this quote from Andrew Scheer, you know, Canadians should make decisions about who comes into our country, not the UN even though the Global Compact for Migration really did not impede in any way on particular countries' sovereignty. And they also um, invoked the questions of kind of freedom in, of speech and didn't like that governments might potentially combat misinformation around migration. And this was another area that they settled on promoting. And you can just see, though, that this is part of their mobilization of their base. As you see, this is part of a petition almost, add your name if you want Canada to remain in control. Um, so they want people to sign up from the, for the party on the basis of these discourses. And so we see this with respect to the, the discourses around um, those crossing into Canada from the United States. Uh, we see very problematic imagery that conservatives use with tweets, you know, of a black man crossing uh, into Canada from the United States. You know, this, these discourses around order at the border, of course, are very racialized discourses. And so this was a very controversial image they had shared. They blamed all of the asylum seekers coming to Canada really on a single tweet by Justin Trudeau. And this other image is of, is of Michelle Rempel and one of her Manitoba colleagues uh, going to the border at Emerson 
um, again, to raise alarm and concern over um, those crossing from the United States. And this discourse I pointed to earlier, uh, this is a form of continuity. Uh, this discourse from the conservatives of compassionate, planned and orderly migration, where they juxtapose this out of control border and problematic asylum seekers with what would be fair and orderly migration, which is implied really by uh, juxtaposing asylum seekers versus refugee resettlement. Uh, and you see Michelle Rempel, the former conservative immigration critic, uh, directly tying um, how we treat asylum seekers from the United States, who they call you know, bogus queue jumpers and that type of rhetoric with the long waits for resettled refugees. And so this played out in the domestic context as well with the conservatives kind of flirting with the United We Roll and Yellow Vest movement that was also linked in some ways to uh, pipeline concerns as well. And this, and you could, this description here is from the Yellow Vest movement saying that their, um, their reason for being of course is to ensure oil pipelines, but also against politicians who would sell out our sovereignty to the UN. And so Andrew Scheer spoke to a reality of this caravan um, when it reached Ottawa and said, we are standing with you, but did not really speak out against any of the problematic discourses. And so in the last few slides I have here, I want to point out though that this type of ideological struggle is not just you know, about the global right, that this has been taking place within Canada even before some of the right populist concerns. And part of this plays out in the type of media and civil society ties that we've witnessed. So for example, the Conservative Party and the elites of the party were trying to get our own version of Sun News Network onto the Canadian dial. And they were perfectly happy at that point, for example, to have Ezra Levant as a dominant media apology. And this formal apology that is pointed to here uh, was from a very problematic um, anti-Roma rant that he had made um, and that he was forced to apologize for while the Conservatives were trying to get that network um, coverage uh, lower on the cable dial and that people would be forced to subscribe to it. But there's been a lot of continuity in the move from the Sun News Network to rebel media, which we all know turned quite uh, controversial. But there are these organic ties between the Conservatives and these further right discourses and approaches. And these things play out in their conventions. Um, Kean Bexley, who is his pictured here, he introduced uh, or spoke to a motion to revoke birthright citizenship, for example, and the following month was hired to Rebel Media as one of their correspondents. So these organic links continue with the party, and he was recently in Washington giving sympathetic treatment to the uh, protests and then what turning to uh, an attack on the Capitol buildings. And Shears tried to steer some of these trends towards a discourse of birth tourism, um, but these problems keep resurfacing for the party. And so I just wanted to point out, while many of the conservatives have distanced themselves from rebel media, especially concerning the Charlottesville riots, which is what turned the, the Rebel News Network into a pariah somewhat, that they're mostly shifting from the old Sun News voices to kind of newer or even the same Sun News voices in other forms. Um, for those of you who might recall when, um, when Andrew Scheer gave his speech, his last speech as leader, he was in, in, encouraging his base and Canadians to turn to smart, independent, content highlighting True North and the post-millennial. Uh, but the, po the True North in its own way has tried to uh, renovate or um, improve the image of Ezra Levant, for example. And the 
one of the main advisors and supporters to Aaron O'Toole was a former Sun News figure in Jeff Ballingall, whose own media efforts have been fairly controversial. And he's one of the publishers of the Post Millennial. And so as a result of some of these, these matters in recent years, although this has been a continuity almost back to the Reform Party, the Conservatives have had to kind of make these proclamations essentially of not being racist, um, but they do this at the time that they cling to this dual discourse. And so I think there's a fair bit of continuity here with what I was describing as the, the Kenniest approach. If you see in bold here, um, this was a major speech outlining Scheer's vision for immigration. And again, invoking the loss of the integrity of our borders, um, inviting new Canadians to you know, be part of our society, but to express their distaste for queue jumpers and line skippers, for example. But because of these align, these organic connections to the far right that I've mentioned, they've had to make declarations such as there's no room in the Conservative Party uh, for racists, for example, and returning to that fair, orderly discourse about the immigration system. Now, just in closing, I do want to note there are also some innovations. Uh, as I cited earlier, the Conservatives try to make these smaller targeted innovations to, to justify their discourses. So if you look at their 2019 platform, for example, they've maintained the similar approach to those crossing the US border, but their 2019 campaign actually called for the lifting of caps on refugee sponsorship. And they associated that with um, religious minorities and religious organizations. Now, um, the one preoccupation of the conservatives has been the persecution of Christian minorities in particular. So it does play out somewhat with this clash of civilizations discourse. And they were also pushing to main, make permanent the rainbow uh, refugee assistance project. So there are these discursive innovations. And in the platform, Scheer even cited the refugee sponsorship efforts of his mother um, as being kind of part of the Canadian common sense. So again, this, this divide between the treatment of claimants and those sponsored. And so Aaron O'Toole is really, there's been a lot of continuity in this respect. He ran on a platform of being a true blue conservative during his leadership. He traveled to Roxham Road to talk about taking Canada back from the left and getting serious at the border. Um, but he too, um, while saying that his leadership is a chance for people to take a new look at the Conservative Party, has run into problems with you know, prominent members of the party having been photoed in mega hats or Derek Sloan's um, existence within the party. Um, although he had spoken up for Eric Sloan during um, his time in the leadership campaign. But once again, we see the Conservatives have to declare, you know, that there is no place for racism within the party. So uh, the, them having to wrestle with the perceptions that stem from their approach to immigrant and refugee issues. And so just to conclude then, um, really, I would argue we really need to pay close attention to the continuities of the Conservative Party from its reform roots, that there are significant forms or continuity in, the, in exclusion, despite some of the discursive innovations that I've mentioned, um, because their approach is to achieve, again, it's a minimum winning coalition, not a broadly inclusive political project, but one that tries to kind of graft enough support onto its base uh, to achieve power. And so this has been part of a, an intense ideological and political struggle. Um, they maintain some very troubling civil society uh, ties. And in some respects, you know, these are a political liability, but it seems to be the nature of the party that these seem to be somewhat inescapable for them. And so there will be these appeal to good immigrants or ethnic voters, 
Um, but the substance of the project in many ways is quite exclusionary, including um, you know, in many life or death situations when it comes to refugees uh, and many immigrants transfer secure existence in Canada. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, John. Um, seeing the uh, the images uh, that you've shown there certainly uh, took me back to some uh, uh, challenging uh, times for uh, advocates uh, uh, for uh, refugees. Um, so why don't we open uh, up the uh, floor for discussion. The way that we'll uh, proceed with the discussion is through uh, the raise hand uh, function. So if you uh, click on uh, the reactions uh, button, uh, you uh, will see that there's a raise hand and we'll use that um, for people who would like to ask questions. So does anyone have any questions for John? Um, I see that uh, I see Howard. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, I have uh, several questions. On the issue of continuity, did you trace back Harper's uh, links with the National Citizens Coalition and its uh, original endemic racism with the Indo-Chinese? Secondly, <laughs> Why did you choose to call it neoconservative since that is often uh, equated with just the economic side of it rather than the cultural citizens, cultural conservatism? So I'd like the choice of language if you would explain it. And thirdly, did you get in, into any of the particulars like the um, government distinction between what it did with the Syrian refugees and rejecting them and the Yazidis, which it sought? to substitute for taking Syrians. Um, that's it, thanks. Okay, I get, yeah, my audio is still on. So are we doing these one at a time, Sean, or are you? Yeah, let's, let's do some one at a time. Beautiful, okay. Uh, so those are some great questions, Howard. Um, for the first one, um, I confess, I, I really had started more with the kind of the reform period and moved from there. Um, but I think you're right to draw these other linkages to earlier, you know, right civil society uh, movements and ideas. And yes, Harper uh, was the head of the National Citizens Coalition. And uh, I had slides I took out because I had too many slides, um, but that did kind of point to some of Harper's earlier remarks um, especially kind of characterizing the Canadian political system, his critiques of the of progressive conservatism, for example. Um, but I think you're right that if one, one could look into those earlier roots of neoconservatism, I think that that's something that um, Murray Dobbin has done um, in books that he's written about the, the Reform Party, like there is a literature devoted to the Reform Party and its roots itself. Uh, so one certainly uh, could do that. Um, secondly, you mentioned neoconservatism and is that not just an economic thing rather than an approach to culture? Um, I, I don't think I would agree with that. I think neoconservatism is actually seen as the kind of mix between neoliberalism on the, on the economic side, but these questions of identity and foreign policy on the other are very much linked to neoconservatism, like the architects of the uh, second Iraq war, you know, are all kind of, are all neoconservative politicians, for example, from the Bush administration that Canadian conservatism feels, neoconservatives feel very closely aligned to. And so the same with these clash of civilizations, discourses and approaches, these are also a part of the, the neoconservative political project. And um, they, so these discourses of 
of trying to make neoconservatism more palatable is kind of part of that. And then with what you are saying about the Syrians versus the Yazidis, well, the Yazidis actually fit very well into this, um, being victims of ISIS and of uh, the this kind of civilizational enemy. Uh, that the Yazidis actually fit the this discursive and neoconservative approach and worldview. You know, Yazidis along with persecuted Christians um, do fit into that neoconservative worldview, whereas Syrians, for who are uh, subjected to extra vetting, you know that there was controversy about that, um, are more on the on the Muslim side of the kind of clash of civil civilizations approach uh, to put it in those terms. So I think, yeah, those discussions kind of fit in there. Uh, the next question is from uh, Sabine. Hi, John. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk. Um, I have a question about um, what you said about the, the MV Sansi and the Ocean Lady incidents. You mentioned that and of course the fallout from these arrivals uh, in the form of the designated foreign nationals uh, still lives on in, in legislation. So which is different from the, the DCOs. You mentioned the DCO regime, which um, has been undone by the liberals. So I'm wondering whether you have any perspective on why the DFN regime uh, has not been thrown out at the same time as the DCO regime, because it also entails this kind of demonization of refugees that you mentioned and the unequal treatment, uh, which seems to be less aligned with the you know small cap, large cap liberal uh, policies. So if you have any thoughts on that, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure actually Sean would probably have better advice on how much the DFN regime has actually been used since the conservative departure. But uh, I think partly the DCO regime was so prominent and it actually impacted on so many people that, of course, there was a lot of litigation around that. And there, I think that we're still sitting with the DFN regime is, is really a sign of, of it's very problematic that the, that the liberals haven't undone some of these measures. Like, yes, they reinstated refugee health care um, and have a, a certainly a better uh, discursive approach, but leaving things like that on the books that you mentioned uh, could really lead to major problems if we have a, a change in government, for example. And I, this is something Adil Attack has written about um, with some collaborators for a CARFEMS working paper uh, that the liberals really didn't undo as much of this infrastructure as we would have hoped. Um, and whereas the DCO regime uh, was found unconstitutional in many respects. Yeah, there's also, um, I think, some, some legal um, factors that uh, influence this, the, the grounds of, of challenging the DFN um, regime are quite different from the DCO regimes. You've got a, you've got an anti-discrimination hook in the DCO regime because it's about designating some countries as, um, uh, as safe, uh, and um, it's clear that at least in some cases that was done based on stereotypes about people from uh, those countries. DFN, the designated foreign national regime, by contrast, applies to groups of people who cross the border or come to Canada irregularly. Um, and mode of arrival is a more difficult uh, grounds for uh, asserting uh, discrimination. So you're having to challenge it, probably based not on discrimination, but based on uh, other um, uh, constitutional protections, um, including uh, kind of protections for the right to life, liberty, and, and security of the person. You get put into very kind of narrow procedural uh, arguments. So I think that's one reason uh, why the uh, DFN uh, regime uh, has persisted. The other is it's just DCO was quite rightly um, the uh, bigger target for, um, uh, for test case litigation and for advocates for refugees because of the, the potential uh, impact, the number of people uh, affected the DFN regime has, has barely uh, been uh, been used. Uh, nonetheless, it 
it is there on the, the books. It's a very broad uh, regime. Um, it uh, could, for example, have been uh, deployed against uh, all of the uh, irregular uh, border uh, crossers. The Liberal government chose not to do so, but a uh, government that had the kind of uh, commitments uh, that uh, John has showed us the former Conservative government had uh, might well have reached for that. If they did, I imagine that the, the issue would have been addressed by the uh, courts. Um, the next uh, person who's asked to speak is actually, uh, John mentioned that Edil has uh, done um, some work in this area and she is asked to uh, speak. Thanks a lot, John, for your presentation. Um, you mentioned the efforts by the Conservative Party um, in terms of um, distancing themselves from some politically incorrect um, narratives. Uh, I'm wondering uh, what was the um, impact or if were there any impacts of um, Maxim Bernier's uh, People's Party of Canada in this um, respect? That's a good question. Honestly, your speculation might be as good as mine. Uh, I mean, it's certainly true that I think there was a concern that they could be outflanked to a degree on, on the right from, from his party. Um, but I think their, the problematic approach kind of predates the People's Party. Um, so I don't know that it could really be fully attributed to that. You know, it's not that they were kind of having an, a decent approach, at least from a human rights perspective, and then all of a sudden, oh, well, Bernier is, is doing this, so we, we have to shift left. Um, but I, it's understandable that that would have been a concern within the party, though, because uh, the nature of our electoral system, if you lose a few percentage in a few ridings, you know, that can make the, the difference between forming or not forming government. Um, so I think it's a factor, but I, I can't say that it's a driving one. Um, but yeah, I can't measure it, to be honest, so I won't pretend to. And our next uh, question is from uh, Trung, who asked me to uh, read out a question. Uh, the refugee uh, private sponsorship program started in 1979 under Joe Clark's conservative government. What conservative ideology can you attribute this innovation to? And how much does it reflect bottom up versus top down government policies on refugee matters? Well, I, I'm sure Howard will have lots to say on this question. Um, I mean, I think it marks the difference in some ways between uh, red Toryism and kind of a blue neoconservatism. Uh, so the, the conservatives very intentionally purged the progressive adjective from, from progressive conservatism in terms of the name of the political party. And I think the, the government of Joe Clark and, and other conservative governments kind of were more, were the distance between a progressive conservative and a liberal government was not that far. And I think the question of bottom up movements is raised. I think that was a great example of a, a powerful bottom up movement, but they found a government that was willing to listen to them. And so they had an openness to, to, to engage in that. And it was um, also in the context uh, of Vietnam, of course, and uh, coming out of the Vietnam War. So they're in some ways as well um, in kind of, you know, geopolitical context that's desirable as well. Uh, but I think it, the, the big thing is that it was a, a less exclusionary version of conservatism that was much closer to uh, the center of Canadian, you know, understandings and discourse. And it was open to the, the efforts of civil society actors like, you know, Howard and many people who collaborated with him. The, the 79 example is, is interesting. You could also uh, think to the, the Mulroney period as an interesting period where there's um, uh, there's uh, some uh, boat arrivals. Uh, initially, uh, Mulroney is very strong on saying, we're keeping the border open to refugees so long as I'm prime minister. 
uh, refugees are, are welcome here. And then um, only a short period later, you see legislation uh, passed uh, trying to prevent the arrival of, uh, of ships. So um, uh, I'm sure there is some um, bottom-up stuff there uh, happening as well. Uh, our next question is uh, Antonio. Thank you, John. That was a very interesting talk. I'm uh, Antonio Soros, Department of Anthropology. I wonder if you can offer an observation that could help, or any set of observations that could help complicate our perspective on the meanings of conservatism in Canada and how it's regionally varied from west to east. Uh, when I think to the leadership race of the Conservative Party, Leslie Lewis, um, a York alumna, no less, finished a close second behind O'Toole in Alberta, beat out O'Toole in Saskatchewan, came dead last in Quebec. Uh, I thought that was an interesting uh, set of data to, to consider when it comes to perspectives on immigration, on race and racialization in this country. And generally speaking of the appeal of a figure like Leslie Lewis and vice versa, the appeal of the conservatism you described to uh, racialized voters in Canada. Any perspective would be very interesting to hear. Sure, that's, um, yeah, several questions in one. Um, I mean, yeah, Lewis definitely, I mean, she had a very strongly neoconservative approach to uh, to her platform and discourses, which I think did make a lot of sense that that played well uh, in Western Canada, which is more of the neoconservative base of the party. O'Toole actually ran in the prior uh, conservative leadership contest as a more, um, more of a, a centrist neoconservative almost versus what he did in the, in the next campaign. So there, it makes sense that there is an appeal to Lewis in those regions. Uh, she came, you know, last in Quebec, partly, probably, you know, language wouldn't have helped. Uh, but Quebec also is not as, um, as clearly neoconservative on some of these lines. Um, Lewis was also very popular too. I mean, it, it's popular to have a figure uh, from an underrepresented population that will speak to the, the common sense of a majority of party members. So I think that was quite um, useful as well, or that was something that would appeal to party members is, you know, finally we have a prominent black woman candidate who's not afraid to speak in neoconservative terms um, in many respects. I think Laura Quack, I wish I'd actually encountered her work earlier, but she's written on the role um, of Asians and the Can Asian Canadians in the Conservative Party and how some of these dynamics play out. And that would probably be uh, useful to consider. Um, did I hit most of the things you were you're asking? Okay. Okay, and we've got another question in the chat. Uh, this is from Anita. If uh, there's time for a question, I would love to hear John speculate about what it means symbolically or otherwise for Harper and Canada's Conservative Party to hold status as uh, the chairperson of the uh, IDU. It's funny because it's not they never talk about that in Canada. So it's not a point of prestige in the Canadian context. If anything, I imagine it's something they would underplay. Um, I think maybe for the movement conservatives, I mean, it does show a Canadian prime minister having a very important role. And there is actually a lot of movement between Canadian and especially American neoconservatives, you know, coming up through US think tanks, uh, you know, education on the types of discourses and approaches to take. So there's a very kind, there are actually very strong organic links um, between the two. So it maybe is of meaning, you know, the fact that Harper took an interest to take on a role like that definitely shows there's an interest and perhaps a prestige to doing that. 
Um, but I think that's something that's probably more internal to, to the, the party elites and those driving these, these shifts in common sense rather than a point of, um, a point to brag about to the Canadian public because the Canadian public is not as fond of, of American style conservatism, um, if that addresses the question. And uh, one other question in the chat, um, I can met you. Uh, I wonder how the concept of Kennyism fits into the neoconservative uh, outlook. So a question about Jason Kenny. Yeah, so that, uh, so the, the notion of Kennyism um, relates really, I used work on Stuart Hall, who talked about uh, the political rights project in the United Kingdom, and he had really looked at that through a lens of uh, what he termed Thatcherism, which was on the one hand, the mix of these harsh uh, neoliberal economic policies but also mixed with law and order discourses as kind of a form of uh, trying to create a new common sense. And the reason I thought to, um, to apply this to the, the conservative approach to citizenship, immigration and multiculturalism, um, employing Kenny in particular as kind of embodying this is that Kenny was the conservative multiculturalism minister uh, or Secretary of State for practically, or for most of the Conservatives time in office. And he held on to that portfolio, even as he moved to human resources, where they vastly expanded the temporary foreign worker program. He held on to that while he was the defense minister, um, advancing a very militarist conception of Canada. And he was also considered credited with as being the face of the Conservatives outreach efforts and a thinker behind that. Uh, so because of the, you know, the discourses he advanced, he had also risen through the ranks of civil society neoconservatism. Uh, he too had been, he had been ahead of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. So he really embodied in so many ways, the political uh, approach of the Conservatives, almost in a single figure. And now he's getting plenty of attention as Alberta Premier, which may actually diminish <laughs> what he was seen uh, in his role at the federal level. Um, but his role at the federal level in terms of political strategy, but also policies that, that were quite exclusionary, um, you know, has a, an important legacy. Great. Um, we've gotten to the end of uh, my list of uh, questions. Does anyone else have any questions before we uh, finish up here? No? Okay. Well, uh, John, uh, thank you so much for this uh, interesting uh, conversation. I mean, I think the, the question of uh, how uh, do uh, conservative movements in, in Canada and elsewhere um, approach these kinds of, of uh, uh, these kinds of issues is is clearly among uh, the most important kind of research topics for uh, those of us who are interested in in progressive kind of policy uh, in uh, this area. So I'm uh, glad you were able to uh, talk to uh, us uh, about that uh, today. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, also to uh, everyone who. Uh, asked questions and who uh, attended uh, today. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much everyone. And thank you again to uh, Sean and Michelle and the center uh, from, you know, before having been in such a good home and for welcoming me back. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all your questions and your time.